to what people were doing, which I think is so amazing. The idea of making a tool and then having people do something which you never expected from it, that's going to be like the, the most exciting thing for a tool maker. This morning about one of the, the cool things about being in a new medium is that you get to like, you get to ride that life cycle that we've kind of seen in so many other media. And so you, you can almost trace the, the line that, that comes through. So I think we're, we're in fast forward mode, but we're starting to like do some things that artists started to get really engaged with in the 60s and 70s, pe pe people, participatory practice. There's, there was this you know, feeling that, that, that the work becomes more significant if it, if it really engages with people. And, and, and it, it, we, we, have an, we have this illusion, it may be, in, in our work that just because people are clicking a mouse that it engages with people anyways. You know, everyone's like, well, it's, we're, what we do is so interactive. But I always thought that the word interaction was kind of a lie with a lot of the work we do. It's, a, it's active, but it's not necessarily interactive. And that you, you, you make an action, it doesn't really pay, pay you back. Um, it's clear to me that iWriter was a big touchstone in this community and that, and that people saw that project and realized that their work could be better if, if it were to A, engage with people, and B, have some quote-unquote greater purpose. The work that's empowering. The, I think the, the maker community has really changed a lot of that too because people are in the same room. By necessity, they're in the same room working with each other. Um, you know, first, I think that what we're, like this, this thing I, I sort of see as like the ultimate uh, manifestation of open source. It's like open source was th is this idea of sharing and then that necessitates people to get together at some point. And so I, it's kind of an aftershock of open source in some way. Open source happened and then this ripple kind of requires people at some, we're humans, we kind of, we talk on the internet, we talk on the internet and we share projects and at some point there's this desire to get together. As far as like, I was I started as a generative artist, and, and I did software-based work that, that, that was contained in its own system. Robert was talking about in his talk, you know, floating in a black space, you know. That, that was exactly what I did for a decade. So, um, and I still love that kind of work, and I still do that kind of work. People just don't pay attention to it because it's not the work that, that, that I'm most well known for, which I kind of love. I love that stuff that I'm interested in. I'm interested in the, in the underlying aesthetic of the data. I'm interested in, 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 uh, in, in how networks manifest themselves at kind of multi-scaled levels. Uh, I'm interested in emergent properties. I'm interested in our brain's ability to, to recognize pattern. I'm, I'm interested in, you know, the first pieces that I did that got, the, that got sort of public attention were, were these uh, visualizations of a year of uh, New York Times news data there. Um, they were called this was 1984, this was 1985, or so on and so on. And the intent of those pieces was actually to show how tangled the, the new, new space was. And, and I kind of, they were kind of a bit of a joke in that, in that I wanted to like push as much information as I could into them. And then, and then people were like, this is, a, this is a beautiful data visualization and it clearly, I'm like, no, it doesn't. It doesn't, doesn't clearly show anything. And that was never the intent of it. But I, I've, I've always been kind of dazzled by that fact that that actually, I don't think people read these things. You know, they, they, that, that people see a data visualization and they assume the intent of the data visualization is to, is to, is to get, again, to provide clarity and to, to, to um, distill something complicated into something simple. And, and that is, rare, is rarely the focus or the result of, of my work. Sometimes it is, rarely. But, but, most often, it's actually not that at all. It's it's to look at the complexity or to look at at the, the network in, in its real in its real form. I'm kind of interested in that, and that and that uh, we are we are in some ways I think. Uh, and, and John talked about this in his talk. John Underkoffler talked about this in this talk about this this forced simplicity that kind of. Uh, uh, does a, a tremendous disservice to our like incredible brains, and and I think that w w with data visualization, it's often about like let's get this really complicated thing into a graphic so that we can better understand it. Part of what part of what I'm interested in is the fact that we we can understand complex systems very well. We're we're really good at it. You know, I'm really good to do, do that thing, and so like for example, for the the the, the um, tool that we built at the Times Cascade, we're kind of interesting in, in embodying the information. In, in a structural way, and then letting people take advantage of this thing that we can do. Because 
I think Mark and I are in the Times are always we're the ones who are like, let's keep on down this path of, of these things, and everyone's like, let's distill it down into a number, right? And so that's always a tension in, in, in that in that kind of work because I th I actually think that we sh we should not be simplifying these things. We should be showing them and letting people read them. Yeah. Anybody through. Uh, I'm not interested in leading anybody through a visual experience or through an art experience. That's something that I've just, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't like at all. When I see um, a, a painting or 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 uh, you know a sculpture, I I don't want to be, I don't want to have it explained to me. I think that's one of the beautiful things about about you know contemporary art in 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 in, in, in specific is is that there is that release of, of that and what, you know I read a lot of a lot of fiction and a lot of novels and the ones that I'm most interested in are also like that they don't tell you the story as much as they put it in front of you and let you understand what what was the actual thing and and for a lot of people that can be really frustrating and for me it's the opposite I I find a, I find a lead narrative very frustrating and I and I I think I think data data as narrative is something that's really interesting and the idea that um, you know, when I talk a lot about the the fact that our lives can be documented through through data, and they are being documented through data. And my my time, the times um, we were we were just sitting in the lab, we were talking about this. We thought it was pretty amazing. Uh, Jake Parway, Brian House, myself, and we all had the same thought, which was like, "Hey, here is the world's largest database of location data that is for for a very rare time free. It's not being held away from us." So let's scramble to get to get as much of it as we can. So that was the idea of the project was let's put something online so that anybody, my 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 dad or whoever, can just plug in their phone, go to Open Pass, click OK, and it goes. So that was the signal. So it's this is how Apple defended it. They said this is not uh, your location data. It's the location data of Wi-Fi signals, which I think is hilarious because they're like, it's not where you are. It's just where something that you are is. You know, like they're like, like <clears throat> if anybody's ever used that that version of Open Pass, I don't. If you do, like, there's no question it's your location data. Like I could watch that. We are we are these opportunistic sensors for the Apple Corporation, and for the Facebook Corporation, and so on and so on and so on. And we are the only ones in that equation who don't have access to the data. And there's, there's, I, I, I'm happy to say this on record because I think the data ownership will become one of the largest legal issues of the next few years. The day that Facebook has to deal with data ownership is going to be a very big day because, because they, do, they do legally deal with it. You sign that thing when you come up with a Facebook account that nobody reads, which is... Uh, it's very similar to what cigarette companies did in the beginning of this cancer thing. You know, little tiny thing at the bottom that says, this is going to kill you, right? And, and, but nobody read it at all. So, you know, again, we have tens of thousands of users, people who are tracking their data. It's stored totally securely. We have no access to your data. We can't get your data because it's double encrypted and we, we just, there's no way we could, we could get to it. But one thing that we do, which is, the, which is to us the most exciting part of the project and brings us back to how it started, was that we allow researchers to come to Open Paths to, project, to um, propose a, a project. Um, so they might be saying, hey, we're studying mobility of um, bike, bikers in New York City. So, so we are going to send a, a, a message out to all the Open Path users in New York City and say, hey, we're doing this study. Would you like to voluntarily contribute your data to it? And, and that, that is, so, so, but I kind of thought it was boring, right? And I was like, ah, whatever. Um, and it wasn't until I, we got Open Path running, and you, when you go to Open Path, you can kind of see your life on this map. I was really, really surprised at how, how profound that data was because it, it was, it was like, like going through a photo album. And in some ways, richer than going through a photo album because you had to imagine things. It was like reading a, you know, reading a diary more than 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 going through a photo album. And 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 I realized at that point that actually this this is this data is something different than than I thought it was because I th I thought the same thing everybody did I think which is this oh well it's just tracking my location you know it's just set a number it's, it's latitude longitude it's boring, but then you realize that that this data is like. More than more than almost anything I can think about is is it's like a trace of your life, and I don't know how many things are more important than that, to 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 have a, a thread and a record of, of 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 your life and what you, where you've been and what you've done and who you've met and who you've loved and so on and so on.
that you may not want to show, but there's some parts of it that might be really interesting. And the idea that you know you could revisit a a, a trip to Paris, you know, with with in that way that is so simple and so elegant, but would provide a framework for a conversation with people, right? So that you know you could sit down with with your with your partner and say, uh, let's let's this this is the map, and, and what was that? What did we do? Oh, that's that time we did this, like. Again, it's that photo album thing, and, and, and to me, really, really interesting. And, and, and something that, I, that since that experience, I've sort of, I'm determined to have, right? That there's one thing about, not, about not dec deciding not to record your location, right? Which is fine. There's another thing about the idea that your location is being recorded, but you don't see it. You know, I, it's that it, it it feels to me like a lot like when you when you when you you're at the doctor and they run they sort of run some tests. I'm one of those people that really wants to see the you know show me the X-ray, show me this thing because you know that's my body. And I even though I don't I maybe won't necessarily understand it and be able to read read from it in the same way that the doctor does. There's a feeling that I that I that I should should sort of own that. So I always love to like I always ask you know can I. Can I, can I have those x-rays or can I have those, you know, so on and so on? Because there's this thing that, it's, and again, it's a question of ownership. I just feel like that's something that I, that I should have. We're, we're very good. We've been very good and some would argue lucky at, at, at being able to face problems as, as they sort of come. But I, we're that, on, that, on that acceleration curve, there will certainly be a point where, where we can't solve this problem anymore and we have to sort of face it which is that, that digital storage in the way that we understand it is, a, is, a, is, is, is not a permanent thing at all. It's a, it's a totally transit thing that depends on magnetic fields and, and, and that's, not a good, that's not a good way to store anything. And that's a very the case is. Although one thing that I've been really interested in lately is this idea that I think we're sort of almost returning to a culture of, of uh, spoken word and, 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 and repetition, and, and, and that's the way that information is being stored. Like, I, I don't really think about archiving my work anymore. The only thing I think about is, like, putting it on GitHub, or because I feel like that, that then it sort of just gets echoed down the path. And while the story may change in the same way that these sort of cultural legends or whatever, they, they change, there's something in the core of it which, which, which won't change. And, that, and that's the kind of, at the root of it, the only thing I'm interested in the work anyways. Like, we we have an, they have this illusion it may be in, in our work that just because people are clicking a mouse that it engages with people anyways you know everyone's like well it's so, what we do is so interactive but I always thought that the word interaction was kind of a lie with a lot of the work we do it's a, it's active but it's not necessarily interactive and that you 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 make an action it doesn't really pay pay you back um, and I don't know part of that is maybe my own failure to communicate part of it is. Uh, is 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 like just a lack of that kind of skill that involved. But you know, the first pieces that I did that got that that got sort of public attention were were these uh, visualizations of a year of uh, New York Times news data. There, um, they were called. This was 1984. This was 1985, or so on and so on. And the intent of those pieces was actually to show how tangled the the new news space was. And and I kind of they were kind of a bit of a joke in that in that I wanted to like push as much information as I could into them. And then and then people were like, this is a, this is a beautiful data visualization, and it clearly I'm like, no, it doesn't. It doesn't it doesn't clearly show anything. And that was never the. And so Brian uh, Brian. House, who's really the lead of this project, um, thought, you know, this is probably too good of an idea to, to let go. So let's instead build a, a suite of very, very, very simple tools that people could load on their phone that would basically allow them to have access to this. Because one of the things that happened in the wash of the scandal is that Apple said, okay, 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 we're not recording your location data anymore, but actually they still are. They're, they're just not allowing you access to it. So, which to us was hilarious that people were like, oh, thank God, Apple, thank you. You know, it was like, <laughs> like the privacy issues are one thing, but then we have this larger issue of like, okay, so this thing I know I can no longer get, you know, which is the root of open paths. It's the, it is the idea that, that we, are, we are these opportunistic sensors for the Apple Corporation and for the Facebook Corporation, and so on and so on and so on. And we are the only ones in that equation who don't have access to the data. And there's, there's, I, I, I've always thought about that, and I've, you know, I've talked about that, about, the, about how the currency in our community is a currency of thanks, which is so beautiful. Like, at the root of the day, you know, there are some coders who would probably disagree with this, but you know, and have, they have a lot of, uh, of, of very uh, 
measured reasons why open source is what it should be, but I just love that beauty of it. That for me, what I, the reason I'm doing that is these emails that I get from people that say thank you, and I just feel so good about that. And it's a human, it's a human thing about about you know, that. That is such a the beautiful thing. You know, I, I aware that you know this. You have to remember what was happening at the time was that software as an industry was kind of becoming software as an industry, and 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 so and and, and commercial software. You would, you know, it's hard for us to remember, but you would go to a store and there would be boxes and they would have discs in them, and and people were starting to understand that you could make money on software. This is relatively new, and and certainly, and, and at the same time there was this other group of people who 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 were who were who were fighting against that. And the, uh, against the commercialization of software, this is a battle that was lost, and it was lost miserably. But it was bravely fought by, by a group of people. And and uh, I was just talking to a, a guy at this um, co conference, a friend of mine, and he was really involved in that scene. And we were talking about it, and and how um, it was this really amazing thing. And people were, you know, in 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 my mind, it sort of birthed itself out of punk rock. And this idea, because you know, punk birthed itself as a rebellion against the commercial, the commercial industry of music, and the and the idea of like that I want to start a band because I want to make money from it. You know, that was like deeply. If we if we trace back like the, what I think, well, I, you know, every, everybody has their own thing. What well, what punk rock is about? It's about that. It's like, in the, the way that they fought it was to like make it almost unpalatable to the to the, to com to commercial uh, industry. You know the software. These software artists who were working in their basement and these these freeware and shareware and and and, and so on and so on uh, um, developers were doing a very similar thing. They were they were writing and sharing and building without with some, sometimes without an intent to to make money from it. Maybe because they didn't know they could, but very often with an active uh, um, political view of the fact that. That software was so important to, and computers were so important to what humanity will become. That we, this is something we need to, we need to conserve, and and again, you know, totally lost that battle, and and, and, to, and open open source is like to me is one of the most incredible things to think about because it's one of the only places where there's like a beachhead against capitalism. You know, it's like here's something that's working. And 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 money isn't involved, which but uh, you know w there has to be a post capitalism. I don't think that the system wor will work for for you know maybe it's thousands of years or whatever it is. But eventually, I don't think it it's not it doesn't work. There's something inherently wrong with it. And somebody was talking about this the other day about like it's like they're putting a shark in your fish tank. Like eventually, that's going to be a really bad idea. You know this idea of competition and so on and so on and so on. So. I, I I like really look at open source as that it's like a, a glimpse at this thing that that is and don't I mean, we don't this is something we maybe don't want to get out because you know if people start to see open source as socialist heaven forbid then then maybe you know this will be a then you know the, the open source menace you know like it's it's destroying American jobs of fine software workers and you know the you know that that's the type of argument that could be made. Because it's not like uh, it, it works. Because I know that if I make a small piece of something, that somewhere someone will make something else that I want. You know, it is kind of an exchange thing that we that we do together collectively. Which you know, w w w there's so many threads that are running through this. But maybe it's this. It's parallel with this return to 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 spoken word and to this sitting around the campfire and we're, we're coming back to this idea of, the, of this human idea of exchange and, and, and you know money is a really weird thing and we forget that it hasn't been around for very long. You know some things so you know I would love to see a world where people like Karsten are paid well to, to share their wisdom and to, to do workshops and, and I think you know that's something that people maybe should keep in mind of you know these these people that that like Karsten who are largely doing all this work completely and uncompensated uh, buy their books and, and you know and, and and you know do those things that that and bring them into your company to speak and you know because that's like something that that yeah I mean he's that he's a machine right so like I don't understand even how he functions I. He's like on a, another plane of reality from me as far as programming goes. I sort of look at, you know, he's a, 
him and Andrew Bell and all these guys who are like, I don't even, I don't know, I don't know where they are. You know, they're. Yeah. Continue, but you know, I have this analogy. I, I come from a biology background, and one thing that I've been really interested in reading about lately is is, is this idea of synchronization and and bi biological synchronization. And there's this concept of uh, sync. You can best example of it is with fireflies. Eventually, if a group of fireflies are together, they'll start they'll start pulsing together. And the way that the reason why they do that is because every time they see a flash, there's like a little action potential inside of them that goes up a little bit. And so, uh, eventually, they they two of them will kind of burst at once and then that pushes everybody up a little bit higher and then and then three of them will burst at once and that puts them up all up a little bit higher until that thing keeps on going and going and everybody's bursting and i you know